Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is episode seven of the We're Young But Justice podcast. Uh, tonight is a, we had a very great uh, recording with uh, Matthew Sardo. He is the founder of Monkeys Fighting Robots. It is a uh, comic aggregate. Com- I aggregate review, or just reviews, comic review and news website where they will uh, take every comic that comes out during the week, re- put a, read it, put a review up, and also talk about big news and that going on in comics, uh, comic movies, comic TV shows, anime, all the fun stuff. And I got to have him on. We talked about uh, the website, uh, his favorite experiences with it, uh, the big news with out of DC that Dan DiDio was fired, and what it means for the future of DC Comics. Uh, we talked about 2020 so far in terms of comics and what our favorite comics have been and some of the big and what we think of the big events. Are they going to be good or is it going to be met? Uh, after that, we transitioned to some sports where we talk about NJ Devils. Uh, we're both fans, so we both talk about it a lot. He's a Mets fan. We talk about that in the NL East and a little previews. And uh, yeah, it's a really fun episode. Uh, please enjoy. Swing drive, right center field. The Braves have won it. Elliott starts right, cuts it upfield, touchdown Dallas. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode seven of the We're Young But Just Us podcast on the uh, Sports Opinions Podcast Network of Podcasts. Today, I'm uh, very happy to welcome uh, Matthew Sardo, who is the founder of Monkeys Fighting Robots. It is a comic uh, and reviews and news website where they cover comics, comic book related movies, TV shows, and anime. And I believe I've seen your tweets. You are bringing a comic book convention to uh, St. Petersburg next year uh so. yes i am totally bringing a comic book you mentioned to saint pete i'm super excited about that i think this is going to be amazing because um saint pete and tampa kind of like don't like each other and tampa gets all the conventions so. <laughs> well isn't that the assumptions or the stereotypes that everybody in saint pete is uh very is old and waiting it's just it's uh what is it called heaven's waiting room i think i heard someone call it <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, I've heard that it's, stereotype before. It is. Um, but yeah, they just announced like the median age dropped to like 40 in the past like 10 years. So uh, we got tons of breweries that have opened up over the past five years. Uh, they have a, a mural festival every year. So over the past five years as well. So the city has been going crazy with these amazing murals throughout the city. Um, so the city is definitely a cultural. It's ready for a comic book convention. That's awesome. Uh, and I think I saw it's, it. I saw the title when I saw your picture of it. It's a, uh, it said indie con in it. So is it mainly related to indie comics? And that's the goal. I mean, I'm not my first convention. I'm not going to try to, you know, get any major uh, Marvel and DC to come out, but like there needs to be a focus on the indie creator uh, because they're making so much uh, better comics than the big two right now. So having it being an indie con doesn't mean it's lesser quality. All right. And we'll come back to, uh, that's a good point. We'll come back to indie comics a little bit later, but let's get to your website. Uh, to, how did that, how long you've been doing it and how did it come about? Uh, Monkeys fighting robots. Well, April 1st will be our five year anniversary, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, I was in sports radio for a couple years down here and I uh, was like the catch-all. I was like the digital director. I was like the beat reporter. I covered the Lightning, the Rays, and the Bucks. Uh, I even went to the Super Bowl when it was in New York and the All-Star game when it was in New York. Um, but what I was doing, I was also building the website and doing all the podcasting and, and doing all the digital stuff because radio uh, back then and still now is kind of behind on the technology side. So uh, since I had the technological background, that's kind of what I ran with. And uh, But then I was like, wait a second, I should do this for myself because my owner was crazy. <laughs> so uh, you do a lot of, I've seen uh, reviews, uh, interviews. Uh, I think I saw you post a Frank Cho interview from a couple years back. What has been your favorite experiences with the website, you know, interviewing creators and all that? Any like big ones that you like really your favorite experiences with it? Um. Wow, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of stuff. Um, 
the the because the website has evolved when we first started um i had a partner and we wanted to do everything pop culture we wanted to do technology craft beer comic books movies tv um and then last year we focused it down and we just cover comic books and it's been such I don't know, such a big change, uh, but it's been a well-received change because all the different comic book websites have been going the other direction, chasing the clicks for movies and TV and rumors and all that stuff. Um, but as far as like my favorite thing of all time, uh, it has to be my Kareem Abdul-Jabbar interview. It hands down awesome. one of the smartest people I've ever talked to. And it just like, my jaw was on the ground like the whole time I was talking to him. What was the topic? Of the, what was the topic of the conversation? Like the, <laughs> uh, you know, it was uh, it was, he had a new book out. I think he had had a new book out, and then also he was doing the circuit before the election four years ago. So he was anti-Trump, and he was just trying to get out a message of positivity, and uh, you know, and just he because I didn't know that he was an ambassador under Trump. I mean, not under Trump, but under Obama and like how many different political things he had done. Um, so if you think about it, he's like one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He did movies. He was with uh, Bruce Lee. And, and now he has this whole political side that he's doing. Like, it's just amazing what he has done in his lifetime. That's awesome. I got to go find that <laughs> interview. Definitely check it out. Uh, a lot of the, yeah, again, a lot of your site. That's, uh, and so, Continue since you do cover news. Uh, it's a big news topic, and obviously you will have seen it on if you go to Monkeys Mon- Monkey Fighting Robots, web Monkeys Fighting Robots the website. You probably have it up there. Uh, Dan Dio, uh, I believe. I don't even know. It might be two weeks now. It definitely was uh, a new. I want to say last week, but it might be two weeks ago that he was let go as publisher is DC. Um, Jim, uh, right now at C two E two is kind of revealed that Jim Lee is on the temporary basis, the only publisher, and there's no other big buzz outside of that. Uh, what are your, what's your whole thoughts on the situation? It's interesting uh, to say the least. I, I've, I've interviewed Dan a few times and um, I've been to a lot of conventions where I've seen him speak. Uh, he's a very passionate guy about what he is. He's definitely a salesman, um, you know, very New Yorker kind of guy. Um, and um I, I don't know. I don't know. I've been trying to figure out like if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I mean, I definitely think that comic books always do well when the best ideas are coming to the surface or just more ideas are coming out. Um, so maybe this change will be good to where like, um, you know, there'll be more different creators, different directions, more things will come about. I, I have, a, I have a friend on my side who, who um, I don't want to give too much information, but he, he deals with AT&T because AT&T bought Warner Brothers, which owns DC Comics. And they've been firing tons of people uh, in the higher levels. And I think this might have been maybe a clash of personalities with the direction of DC. But also since there was two publishers, Jim Lee and Dan DiDio, they might have just been dumping salary because AT&T has no money. They spent all their money to buy Warner Brothers. So this might just be a financial thing when it all comes to the surface. Yeah, and then and speak, if you brought up AT&T and everybody's talking about the doom and gloom and it's led to a lot of clickbait as you brought up with other websites, a lot of clickbait articles saying that, I think it's just a ridiculous notion that AT&T which is sell off DC, especially in the world of IP and the value of IP, uh, in uh, intellectual property and with especially with HBO Max coming out, why would you sell off IP? And uh, it's crazy to think that this has evolved to the point where there was this much clickbait articles about AT and T selling DC off. And you know what's really funny is a year ago, um, I was I mentioned because my timeline came up with like, oh, this is what you did a year ago. I had commented on a clickbait article that Marvel was going to sell off the comics brand to and have like IDW handle comics and publishing and stuff like still keep the intellectual property, but just let another comic book company deal with the comic book side. 
and here we are a year later and everybody's like, oh, DC is going to sell. And like, it, they're not, they're not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It, it's Ever. just a ridiculous notion. It's, I, it's, I, it's like, <laughs> you're selling off Batman and Superman, like the, the Six Flags parks, those deals, the movies, uh, like they make money. And, and as I've heard on other news sites and podcasts that I listen to, DC is not like a negative. They don't draw a negative, the comic side. It, it is a technically a profit. Not like the ones that make a big corporation like AT and T, but they're not bringing the whole company down. And it's it's kind of a ridiculous notion to think that they would just sell off. Uh, and someone brought up a good point. It was like, why would AT and T want to be the ones who said, "Oh, we sold off Batman and Superman"? Yeah, and I, they would they would they would never do that. What what they would do is they would shut down DC and hand off the like they would still own the intellectual property but they would give it to another company. They would basically like, hey, we will sell you the rights to produce a Batman comic book. And I, I, think, I think that could happen, um, but they'll never sell the intellectual property because that's the whole reason why Warner Brothers bought DC and that's why AT&T brought, bought Warner Brothers because of all that stuff. I mean, like it's... It, um, and, and going back to the comic books is... People always say that DC is getting outsold by Marvel. Marvel produces twice as many books. So even if they were, DC was selling really well, they might never catch Marvel because they're putting out as many books. So people are like, oh, Dan DiDio's always been second place with DC. But that's fine. Like you sh you're not competing against Marvel, you know, for people's dollars. It, it is crazy. Like people, it's not really a competition these days. I don't even know if anybody in the comics industry just has disdain for anybody like higher executives would have for different companies. I mean, it's, they all like know and talk to each other and are friends with each other. It's, that, that's just the way comics is. It's not really like a bloodthirsty rivalry out there between the people that work at DC and Marvel. I, I think when it was in New York, you might have like a, a decent rivalry not like a you know like a bloodthirsty rivalry but the, like a gentleman's rivalry of like doing better and creating more series and but once they moved offices to LA LA is just a different mindset everybody everybody's just you know everybody's just LA <laughs> <laughs> it is it's not New York I'll tell you that <laughs> it's, it's not it's not so um and then on the thoughts and then of course the whole talk surrounding and maybe the reasons why because nobody can pinpoint why i mean we you brought up a theory it's just one of millions of theories it's that's all we're at right now is theories and the big uh one with dc is uh is the 5g which was another semi or full-on reboot that they were planning to do and we kind of don't know which side Dan the deal fell on. We've been hearing rumors, like unsound rumors that Snyder, Scott Snyder fought with him. We did hear that he got from uh, Ble Sky sites like Bleeding Cold. He wasn't happy about the, it potentially tying into death metal. And uh, 5G has uh, just been a weird topic for all year. I think in, in addition today, uh, well, we're recording on March 3rd, Green Lantern, more since Green Lantern was extended to the full 12 issues, which is putting more talks of, when is 5G happening? Because we thought that was the reason it wasn't going to a full 12. So uh, what, what are your beliefs on 5G and if, when is it coming and what is it going to be with the DO gone? What's, what's the thoughts? And obviously your new set, what have you been hearing maybe? I think right now it's kind of like up in the air. Um, again, we don't know what the directives are coming from AT&T or Warner Brothers to DC Comics. I, I know that Jeff Johns left. Now Dan dio has gone. Jim Lee is in charge. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing because I don't really think he's been in charge of too many things. Like, I don't know if he's like a figurehead or if he actually is, has theories and has plans and, and is like an architect uh, like a Jeff Johns is an architect, like a Scott Snyder is an architect. Um, it will it'll be very interesting to see what happens with 5g um I, I think comics in general are going through crazy evolution going on right now and the marvel and dc are not handling it well you know like what does really well is independent comics they come out for a little series they do a trade if it does well they continue it uh, you know and it's 
this ongoing like self-contained stuff to a 12 issue maxi series where you get 12 issues for that full year and then it comes in a nice book at the end of the year and that's how it is you yeah i guess you can keep the numbering if you wanted to but like we're going to do a season like they need to go to a season model as to as opposed to like just running an infinite number of ep- episodes or issues it has it, it's crazy i mean not crazy amount of trunks we're still having the monthlies and the ongoings but like i think a Bendis's and David Walker's and Jamal Campbell's Naomi was considered a season one and they're waiting for Jamal to get done with Far Sector that they're going to come back for season two, which I assume will be another six issues. So I'm curious if that definitely will become a trend. As you said, yeah, indie comics, you tell a story, uh, collect it and trade it and you come back and maybe do it again. Uh, I think that it might be the trend. As he, do you think it's they're, it's slowly coming in or you think it's just they – it just needs to happen more, is it, or is it happening? Or you think it's happening enough? Sorry, um, I worded that no, very badly. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> it's like with Marvel and DC, it's two completely different beasts because like you have so much continuity going on. Um, what I always believed, and if I ever become editor in chief or publisher of Marvel and DC, this is what I will switch to. I think they need to go to a ten-year model where it's like issue one starts now and and then 10 years later, they end the universe completely. And then they reboot it every 10 years. So then you can go to kind of like talking about it like baseball, where like I like in the seventies as opposed to the nineties. And then you can be like, I really like Batman in the seventies compared to Batman now. And then you can start having those decade comparisons. It's funny just how much people like hate and also love continuity. It's just great. I mean, people are just like continuity is just a big with a lot of people. So it's like you do the reboots and then people will go on about the continuity not being there. And like these characters aren't like how they used to be. I know the big Bendis complaint is <laughs> he ignores continuity. Just continuity is so beloved, but it's also such a convoluted mess. Well, that's why I think the like 10 year model and I'm, 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 this is me, I'm, I'm championing to be an editor of uh, one of the big two, but the 10 year model, that's a lot of time. If you think about that, like, you know, starting as a kid and then you know, maybe, and then ending when you're like 24, that's like a solid 10 period of time. Or if you pick up comic books in your twenties, you go to your thirties, like nobody, there are, I don't think a lot of people read comic books for 20 and 30 years straight like i don't think those people exist so i think if you write for a generation whether you catch it in the middle or you're right at the beginning or the end like there's a chance for you to catch up and and i guess this i forgot to press uh preface this what fans want the most because it does this doesn't happen in any under any under industry is they just want to know what the rules of the game are. And you don't get that in comics. It's like you're reading a book and then one day like, yeah, we're rebooting it next week. And that just, that's insane. Like there are no rules to the game of comic books with the big two. And the rules seem to be getting crazier and crazier uh, as, as media and things speed up. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, just, it's crazy. Like, yeah, I think the uh, biggest complaint with, uh, I think new two was, yeah, you told us that some things aren't con- Some things are continuity still, but you didn't tell us exactly what it is. And then, uh, I mean, you, I remember, I think secret wars happened with Hickman at the end of that. And then that didn't, what exactly happened out of it? Did we reboot? Did we not? It didn't reboot. I think it was going to happen, but we knew what, didn't know what happened because of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a mess. <laughs> Let me tell, I mean, come on, we're at 80, 81 years. I think this 82 Superman was, I think the anniversary is two years ago. So we had 82 years of continuity messes between both companies. So uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to and see. It's... So uh, yeah, you, you kind of t- talked on Jim Lee a bit. So you're not sure the way it's going to go. So what do you think? Are they DC's just gonna, is, are they going to go corporate? Is that just what it's going to be? Or are we just going to have to accept that we're going to have more, a lot more corporate decisions? with the creative what side? I don't, I don't think it's going to be corporate decisions. I just think they need to find new leadership right now, whether that's a, a Scott Snyder getting promoted or somebody outside the industry, whether it's a, somebody at AT&T or Warner Brothers or somebody outside 
just looking at DC Comics as a whole and being like, this is what I think the best direction is for the company. And then you just follow one voice. Uh, not that it's a bad thing, because you can still have people go off, you know, with, you know, like, hey, we're going in this direction of continuity or not continuity. And then you can have people making crazy flash books over here and this over there and Swamp Thing and Robin and all this other thing. But like, you still need, when it comes to like the big two, like one singular voice of like, this is where we're going. And, and it could be that we're going in not continuity, that stories can just be whatever, but you just need, you can't have, you know, Jeff Johns over here doing a non-continuity story and then this guy doing something else of rewriting what Jeff Johns is writing at the same time. It just, you know, if, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, because that's just why DC is just not interesting to me right now. I think I, I like, I'm a big Bendis fan, so like I follow his books because I know his own world of continuity. But then outside of that, like the whole line just doesn't interest me. Like because of exactly that point. We don't know what's going on. Right. And that's, that's, you just need somebody to come out and be like, this is what's going on. And, uh, yeah, I mean, DC and Marvel are crazy right now. <laughs> they are very crazy. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Marvel's continuing their thing. A lot of events <laughs> at the same time in DC's, I guess they're not typical DC. They're just in a, in a mess. <laughs> they're just completely in the mess. They need direction. That's a good segue to a quick little rapid fire a little bit. Uh, or not really. We have time. Uh, you're, what do you think of where end of two months? I'll say about two months in technically the beginning of the third month. What is, uh, what have been your hits so far? Obviously your review site, you see a lot of comics, almost all of them. I'm pretty sure. What, what has been the biggest hits for you so far? Oh man. Um, I really love the new Wolverine book. I thought that was like my perfect, like now and then book, you know, because there is a, there's a story I mean, it's all on continuity, but there's a story in the beginning um, that's all about what's going on with the X-Men and the universe that Hickman has created. And then there's a backup story. I don't, I don't even want to say it's a backup. It's an equally, two equal stories, but it's in the back of the book. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a vampire thriller action movie. And I was like, oh my God, this is my nineties action craziness that I really want. So I, I got a nice, a nice little, I don't know, taste of both, you know, like what's modern and then like the glory that I love about comic books. Was that section, the Bogdanovich, the Bogdanovich section? Yeah. Yeah. So a guy know Cooper, I guess Cooper did the, Adam Cooper did the first story. And I don't know. I didn't really look too far how it's going to work. I think, I know they're both on it. i uh, just, uh, yeah, I think the price tag scared me away a bit, but I didn't really uh, pick it up because of that. <laughs> I do, but I have been here. Yeah, of course, it's been really great. Uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. uh, I, you're in college, correct? Yeah, that's why. I, like, I can't really break that budget. <laughs> well, no, I, w I was wondering. I mean, like, most of my friends have jobs. They're post-college, and so they're like, okay, uh, but you're in college, and paying $8 for a book has got to be insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to pick it up. I think the week it came out, I'm pretty sure it's last week, I had, like, just pulled. Like, my polls were, like, five books, and then I picked – or, like, four books, and then I was like, oh, I had to pick up the giant size for Hick because it's Hickman, and then I picked up uh, Bendis' Leviathan, one shot that six books, and I was like, I mean, Wolverine's awesome, but I don't have room for the $8 book. Like, I'm already fretting buying that Flash book, but I was like, I like the Flash enough to buy that prestige book, but <laughs> then with their $80, um, not the $80, their 80th anniversaries for everything is going to kill me. <laughs> Got to pick and choose. Yeah, no, I would, I would hate to be in your, your position with that. Uh, I mean, like, luckily Marvel and DC send me books in a review. Uh, <laughs> but if I was, because I, I think about it when I was like buying comic books and they were right around three bucks, you know, I can get 10 books for 30 bucks and you can get a nice stack and you can read them and everything like that. But now like 30 bucks gets you what? That's you know. eight. I think I spend for the six was, I think 25, 25 to 27, I think was six. So yeah, it just, it really depends. So like it, the cheapest now it's three ninety nine, four $4. That's the cheapest. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think that's been the biggest thing with comic books is that price tag. Because, like, I mean, you're I get Hulu for five ninety nine a month, and I get like CBS for five ninety nine a month, and I get to watch put all the Picards I want, and uh, you know, and people are, you know, I I don't know, I don't they got to figure out that I don't know why they don't go back to a cheaper printing and lower the prices of the books. I, I that bothers me so much. <laughs> I don't. I don't even know what it is. I've heard the artists complain. The art, not the artists complain. Art, art, artists are amazing, but their their resources and what all they have, and then all that. I really don't know what it is. But yeah, it's, and Marvel, it's, Marvel and DC have been outsourcing their artwork to, you know, Central and South America, and the artwork looks amazing, but they're not paying them as much as they used to pay. You know, people from the states, which that's a whole other whole nother chaos of <laughs> everything's a new uh, can of worms <laughs> with comics yeah. it really with is comic. uh, that's why that's why people are, are you know like if you can you, uh, you and an artist uh i don't know if you draw or you could be the artist and i could be the writer but you know people can put their own comic together put it on kickstarter and not even have to worry about it and 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 get it published and get it out there so it's it's really going to change how things go. I mean, like I think Marvel and DC really need to think about how they're making books and how they give them to people because like there's tons of indie creators making amazing comic books that um, you don't even have to go to a comic book shop to get. I, I that's since Mar since I get a lot of review books digitally to me, I, I started buying more books on Kickstarter. Like I'll peruse Kickstarter and I'll be like, oh, I'll get this book, I'll get this book. And, and I'll, you know, cause then it's kind of a surprise when they come in. Um, but yeah, that's been where I've been spending my comic book dollars is on Kickstarter. That's right, like one of those things is like, man, I can't wait to have the full job. I just wanna, like I see all these amazing Kickstarter campaigns and books that really appeal to me. And I was like, dang, these are, these are awesome. I can't wait to be able to spend more money on in support. Yeah, the, I mean, the indie guys, it's like, I really wanna support the guys that are, spending a hard time creating their own stories. They're not getting crazy editorial mandates. Like this is their work a lot. I mean, it, it's coming out of their heart and soul and that's the story they want to tell. Yeah. But, um, coming out tomorrow is Spider-Man Noir number one, which is kind of like a elsewhere tale. And the artwork is amazing in that book that Marvel sent me that. And I have it sitting on my desk right now and I've been flipping through it. And I'm like, this book is amazing. And, it's kind of like a Sin City-esque feel. Um, and Peter Parker's a detective and the artwork is just glorious. So uh, that's what I'd recommend for this week. Do you read it in Nick Cage's voice? <laughs> like when you have oh, it in your man. head. Do you have Nick Cage in your head? <laughs> now for me, I got like... You, now you've ruined the book for me. Oh, um, no. <laughs> Don't blame me. Blame the spider verse Because <laughs> I will always have, like, 80s Spider-Man. Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends cartoon voice has always been the Peter Parker voice in my head. So that's where I – oh, that's the voice I always hear. It's just all I think of Spider-Man Noir is Spider versus poor the poor man in his Rubik's cube. Yeah, <laughs> but that's good to hear. No, are yeah, I did remember seeing that coming on the docket. I'm glad to hear it's amazing. Uh, yeah, um, I guess my I really don't talk about my favorites. You know, my favorites. So obviously, I just I finally got the Zdarsky, and I've been loving the mini series he's been doing because I love the Fantastic Four. So I've read the Fantastic Four and X Men. I just find. It amazes like, damn, where's Zdarsky been all my life, and why am I just now reading him? <laughs> I think that I think there's a, there's a lot of chip stuff out there. Then, like, you will definitely have a lot of fun reading his stuff. Then, I just can't wait to get the life story. I've been hearing nothing but amazing stuff about that, and I just that's I, that I need to read that. I know that much. So uh, that was one of our. I think we. I think that was like. I think issue three was. We gave it one of the best covers of last year. It's uh, I think it's a, it's a disco ball. It's a '70s issue. I think it's a disco ball with a uh, goblin bomb on the cover, and it looks really cool. Yeah, that Spider-Man lights. I mean, of course, I just finished Ultimate Spider-Man, and it was ultimately. I didn't really mean to say ultimately, <laughs> but that is my 
like top Mount Rushmore stories and then to see Bagley on that it's like and Zdarsky is like damn I need to read this like Bagley on Spider-Man is like oh goodness it's just some of the most beautiful stuff uh my favorite art I've ever seen so I know I gotta get to that uh yes yeah, so outside of that the best that's really the book and of course I think Hickman just everything Hickman lately has just been blowing it out of the park since like issue five I think it's just been amazing how, how much have you caught for the X-Men or I caught everything but what's your favorite so far the X-Men stuff sorry I know you catch everything. <laughs> no, it's 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 fine. I mean, the X Men stuff is just me, kind of like. It's weird. Like I'm a I'm a Spider Man and like a Thor, Green Lantern. That's like been my my three. But I've always read X Men. Um, uh, but it's never been like. I never feel like I'm part of the X Men. Like it's weird. Um. <laughs> But I, I, for me, the design work on all those issues has just been through the roof. Um, it, it totally feels like a different brand of Marvel Comics. Like the X-Men have their own brand and it, I like it. I like it a lot. Like I feel like it's got a really a great feel to it. Like I'll pick up a book and I'll be like, oh my God, this is Hickman being like crazy graphic designer and telling everybody what, what he wants done with the book. and like it's it's I've, I've enjoyed them i've enjoyed them and i just i like the feel of them there's a very there's a very textural thing like they did the whole thing with the with the language you know you, there you where you could figure out what was going on because they created that language in the books and stuff and people were figuring it out on twitter and stuff which is funny it kind of dates back and if you even look at avengers in his adventure runs it dates back to the fact that he's just like he grew up a huge dc fan everything about it like he i know he's a huge legion fan so you know he'd wanted to play with the language and then i remember adventures he got to do his own crisis it's just funny to think about damn think about wow and that's i don't like to think anybody steals anything because really they do trade everything it's like damn this guy was really influenced by a lot of dc stuff and i remember him coming out and saying that like that was his childhood books not even the marvel stuff uh but yeah, yeah. dude that x-men 7 the one that just came out was my that and New Mutants, his last New Mutants, which I'm very sad he's not doing. Those were my favorite issues of the year so far out of all comics. I mean, that was, they were, it just, that, those were amazing. And I'm, I'm sad to see he's not on New Mutants permanently. I kind of, I had to drop it because of that. Yeah, you got to make those tough decisions. And uh, I think that's the thing now is like, we follow writers so much now. You know, like it's, we'll hop, I'll follow Hickman where he goes or, you know, uh, Chip, you'll follow Chip. When Matt Fraction was doing his stuff at Marvel, I was following Matt Fraction wherever he went. I mean, like, it's it's really interesting that we're not tied to the characters as much as we used to. Yeah, that's, that's actually my biggest thing. It's like, yeah, I mean, and the more I think about it, it's like, yeah, I got into comics and I was like, man, I love these characters. Like, I love, fell in love with Young Justice and I was like, I love Ra uh, Ra that Robin, Tim Drake, Superboy, Wonder Girl, Impulse and all of them. And the more I read, the more I was like, dang, I want to read everything Ben this writes. I want to read everything Hickman writes. And it's like, man, I'm following, I'm following the writers or the creators more than anything. If I see a Bagley or, or, or uh, Alex Maleev, it's like, dang, I'm following them. I'm not really following like my favorite characters. It's, it, you're right on that. Just imagine like, I don't know, like if you're a Cubs fan and Joe Madden goes to coach the Angels, you, you just put down all your Cubs gear and you just pick up all Angels gear. Like that just... That boggles my mind. They yeah, are sacrilegious, but that's how comics. That's how comics is. Yeah. And uh, all right, you know, we're at the good transition point, but we'll do a rapid. Uh, this will be the rapid fire since every since you said it, you love continuity and you bet uh, you love continuity quotation mark. Uh, yeah, your nay to these three big events that I had. I think the biggest of 2020 are going to be these. All right, DC Dark Metal. Yeah, your nay to the, uh, the excitement level. I always have to be excited for whatever Scott Snyder and Capullo are working on because they're crazy. <laughs> I wasn't the biggest fan of Dark Knights, and I'm not a, wasn't really appealed by his Justice League. I might pick it out because I know it's just going to be the biggest DC thing, and it's like I have to read it. But I'll be uh, he Capullo is I got to meet him, and he's awesome. His art is just beautiful. Did you read uh, the Man Who Laughs miniseries? Uh, After no. No, I didn't. So basically, whatever you think of Dark Knight Metal, they out of Dark Knight Metal came one of the greatest villains 
out of the past like 30 years to like come out of DC Comics. Oh, the with... character. Oh, the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Well, yeah. well there's a, yeah. There's oh, yeah all, the, well, they had yeah the book, right? They had a, the... yeah, they had a mini series afterwards that was really took a deep dive into it. That was like really good, um, and I it was written by Snyder and I think Jock Jock did it, and it was I I mean like. I'm trying to think of the last like insane villain to come out. And I think it was Superboy prime came out, you know, maybe, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago when he came out after that crisis event. And, and, and so now you get this like Batman Joker character and like, it's just, just it, he, he's like Marvel's version of carnage and he's just taken over. And it's, it's brilliant to see when people can create something new like that. I was kind of on the opposite side. I, to be fair, I didn't read too much, and I, I kind of view him as the outsider of he's getting thrown in everything. <laughs> so I guess I got to take a dive into it and before I really judge him too harshly. <laughs> that's all I see. Yeah, I, he was thrown in everything. Well, that's that's kind of what happens. I mean, when I grew when I when I was reading comic books in the '90s, um, every comic book had either like Spider-Man, The Punisher, or like Wolverine as a guest star because those were the three hottest characters at marvel at, the, at that time and so if you flip through old books it's like oh the punisher's here oh wolverine's here oh spider-man's here and it's they were just they were just trying to sell books at that point in time i mean yep you got to sell books that's how <laughs> that's how you uh, keep the lights on uh all right next event so dc dark metal the yay uh empire which is al ewing and dan slot yay or nay i'm like in the middle on that one I'm in the middle on that one. I, I, I want to see like the resurgence of the Fantastic Four. And I like Al's work a lot. I think he's pretty amazing. I just don't know how much they're going to rewrite history of like the Avengers and the Kree and the Scrolls universe. Not that I'm like a deep dive into that, but I, I never a fan when they like rewrite history to create a new story. I'm just not pessimistic because I I'm getting into Al Ewing lately because I picked up Guardians and I'm just liking his stuff and I know the, all the Immortal Hulk. I just when I try to read Dan Slott, I find his work kind of boring. <laughs> so I really I couldn't even get through Spider Man too much. I tried, but it's like I I just got bored by Dan Slott's writing. So I hope I mean so that's why I'm kind of split on the fence about it. Uh, I don't know how you feel about Slott personally. Uh, uh, Slott's writing, not personally. <laughs> I know you, you said that. I'm like, I like all I heard. No, I'm not, all I, I know he's funny. I follow him on Twitter. He's funny. <laughs> I heard all my friends going, "Don't say what you want to say, Matt. Don't do it right now." Um, no, Dan Slot. Um, I liked what he did with Superior. Well, my thing with Dan Slot is that he doesn't respect uh, the mythos or the building blocks that make up characters he is going to push the envelope however way he can to change the story. And, you know, where you get, he's like, I'm going to make Dr. Octopus Spider-Man. Like, it's, you know, I mean, it, and it's a good story. It was a good run. Um, but was it a Spider-Man? T- was it a Peter Parker story that I wanted to read? No, it wasn't. But it was, I mean, so there's elements, there's basic elements that make up each hero. and Dan Slott doesn't care about those. And so that's my issue with Dan Slott. <laughs> there you go. I just find it, I, 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 can, I can mind stuff getting thrown out because I find myself not caring about the stuff that's thrown out. But I guess, yeah, you're right, the building boss. I just find them boring. <laughs> Again, whatever he writes, I kind of just find it disinteresting. So that's why I'm probably going to skip. All right, last event just released, uh, and not, not just really, just announced. And of course, I know I'm not skipping it. And by the what we talk about the X Men, I doubt you will. I doubt, I bet you are very interested in that. It's Ten of Swords. I know that it's going to be yeah. like the style of, and it's going to be the style of the old X Men, right? It's not going to be its own book. It's going to be across all of them. I think that's going to be crazy. Um, and I mean, I loved Mark Brooks's cover art. I, I don't. I must admit, I missed the C2E2 panel on it, so I didn't catch what it is yet. Uh, but all I saw was everybody with swords jumping at me. Um, that was amazing. Poster, it is I was amazing. Like, <laughs> I love that <laughs> word. And I was like, okay, you kind of got me with that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm on board for um, the first year of X-Men, like where they are right now. Like, 
I'm definitely in for like year one and year two to see how long Hickman carries on the brand. This is his infinity. Like if we're talking about in comparison to the Avengers, his Avengers, yeah, that, yeah this, is, this has to be his infinity, like that middle road, middle of the road event, I would think. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he brought everybody together. So you got your introduction, now you're gonna have an event and then he's gonna close it out with another big event. And uh, so yeah, no, I, this could be his Empire Strikes Back. And I uh, know Hickman, he hasn't disappointed me yet. His Fantastic Four is my, on the on this Mount Rushmore with Ultimate Spider-Man. Uh, Avengers was amazing. And X-Men, I just said, the New Mutants and X-Men have been my favorite issues. Those individual issues is the best so far. All right, let's get away from the best and out of the comics and talk about, sadly, the worst of the worst. You're a Jer- I mean, you're the, you came from, you are uh, a transplant, right, from Jersey? I'm guessing it's the only way you're a Devils fan. I grew up on the, uh, I'm from New York. I'm, I grew up on the Jersey border uh, next to, I don't know if you ever heard of Action Park. I, I went to like, Action Park two years ago and it's called Mountain Creek now. Yeah, I have yeah, a scar I from Action Park back in the day. Um, but yeah, I uh, I had a best friend in hockey and he was a Devils fan and there really was nobody else who was into hockey. Uh, my brother was a Ranger fan. So I just went, you know, my buddy and I, I kind of, jumped on his uh, coattails and became a Devils fan. And then it was, it's, I've just been a Devils fan forever since then. So it's, it's, uh, it's, I like it. I like my Devils. <laughs> I love New Jersey. I love the Devils. That's, that's born and raised. And sadly I had, I was the, the, an infant when they last were six, I'd say six or five years, five or six years old when they won their last Stanley Cup. I did enjoy the 2012 run. That was middle school. That was fun because the, we had like, it was amazing in middle school. We had teachers who were Rangers fans, teachers, Devils fans, and you're all split. Like one of our lunch aides got on the table and it's like talking crap to Devils fans right before they lost, of course. And then when it's like going off about, oh, the Kings are going to win. It's like, get over it, you Rags fans. You lost. Like that was like some yeah. of my favorite sports memories were in middle school with that series. <laughs> I mean, so, but right now we're at the opposite end of the spectrum. And it's even worse than being a sucky rebuild team is a, uh, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> like the rebuild, we're have they're gonna have to rebuild the rebuild. And uh, I, I mean, first thoughts. I mean, what what are your first thoughts on all this? Because everyone's been fired and Taylor Hall's traded. I mean, we have they have to rebuild the rebuild. What's your thoughts? Well, my first thought is just it, we. I went in with such excitement for this season, and you know, I bought the NHL package, and and I was like ready to go, and then they just didn't win and I was like okay if they get back to 500 I'll start watching again and they're just now starting to get back to 500 but like um I follow a podcast called Devil's Insiders and in here good podcast that is that has been the best thing ever I started watching it I started listening to it when they went to the playoffs uh, two three years ago now uh that's gonna be um right towards the end because I was like, oh, the devil's going to make the playoffs. I'll, you know, they, they, down in Florida, hockey's not that big. And I don't have a lot of hockey friends. So, like, even though I play hockey, um, but I don't have a lot of friends I talk to daily about hockey. So, um, you know, for me, I just needed to be on my radar of them being above 500 kind of thing or in the playoff chase to kind of make it worthy. So I started listening to Devil's Insider. I got really excited. Uh, and then they fell off uh, last year. And then they made some changes and they got Jack Hughes. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. And it's been super disappointing and sad. <laughs> it really has been. I was so hyped that first night. I was, I was like, I have to watch this game. I have to watch every game. It was like, because I, I, I'm mooching off the parents' cable so I can have MSG go. <laughs> and I can watch every game. And I've just been so, I was so excited. And it's like, oh, that first night we're up 5 nothing, And I was like, really? That's been, it was a tale for the whole season on the first night. It really was. Yeah, that was that. I was such a gut punch, but I, I was like, I was still like, oh man, we were up five nothing. We scored five goals, so like, I right, we're gonna we're gonna win games like four three or five four. Like it'll still be like, we'll still be fine. We'll you know, <laughs> and, and then it just, yeah, it just wasn't fine. Um, but I mean, I, I am a fan of you know letting all the kids play and and uh, seeing what you got and and um, you know. Uh, Mackenzie Blackwood's been a bright spot. Um, uh, Gusev, I, uh, Gusev is what the Devils have needed forever. Because if it's a shootout, 
that guy's going to score and the devils need that. And uh, so there's been a few bright spots. I, I'm interested. I really, I'm rooting for Marty Brodeur to be the GM. That's my, my pick if we're going to go GM. Um, but uh, a Tom Fitzgerald, I think is doing fine. Um, I just, I don't understand the rebuilds. Like if you're a professional sports team, I don't understand these long rebuilds. Like you have money, there's free agents, there's drafting. Like you should at least be competitive to where you're like a rebuild should be considered coming in eighth place, not coming in last place. So I don't like these where you just suck for four years and then you're like, Oh, I got some talent and we might be good and might be viable. I was like, no, like every sport, you should be vying for the playoffs. Not like, oh, we'll be good in two years. Like, we're paying money. Do your job. Win games. <laughs> yeah, the mentality right now across all the big four, big four is that not making the playoffs isn't good enough. And I feel like if their max is making the playoffs, then they're not doing their job. And that's why they, they always just blow it up. I mean, the Devils were st- – the worst part about the Devils were they, they're stuck in this awful situation where they – had to retool and rebuild, and Lamarillo was like, didn't want to. It's, I don't want to say he didn't want to rebuild. Obviously, you want to win and rebuild your franchise, but he didn't want to like. He didn't go through that big process again, and it really put him behind for a while. And then Ray Shiro had to come in, and then he had his holes, and then he stuck with his guy too long at Hines, and then he was on Saracen let go. We heard rumors about him not getting along with the the was it the analytics guys that the owners put in. And so now we're back to square one. We, is it Fitz? Is it Brodor? Is it an outside guy? I mean, I'm happy with the way they're playing and that these guys are coming through, but, you know, I'm, the future is just so uncertain right now. Like, I think you're going to see three young guys come in and change the makeup. And I, like I said, I think if you get one or two free agents that you put out there, uh, to make it work, I think you're going to have a decent team. Um, I mean, look at Phoenix. They got, they got Taylor Hall. They're not, they're not going to the playoffs right now. I mean, like, and the Devils have three first-round draft picks next year. So he did, they're going to have – did a great job with that. That was – Yeah. That's why he, he's a big candidate right now. He was lauded before. Like, everybody's – when Shearer was still here, when he was the assistant, people were after him. And he's showing why people were after him. He was able to make the best out of the situation he was handed. He's gotten the draft picks, and he either he or the next guy's going to be able to do something with those draft picks. Yeah, because one of those one of those three draft picks is going to be on the team next year. Like that has to happen. Like one of those three draft picks. So that'll be a player. You'll have Ball and Ty Smith on defense, and I'm trying to think of who the who the uh, prospect they got. Um, for the Coleman, defense, the, the Coleman, no, no, oh, the offense. Um, I'm butchering his name, um, so I'm not gonna say it. Uh, <laughs> I, he's I gonna, he's gonna be a top six player, so they're gonna have they're gonna have a lot of rookies on the team next year. Uh, so they're gonna need to get some like glue guys and some, you know, uh, I don't know, bottom. Oh, like a number three and four defensemen. I'm trying to oh, think who left, who's left. They definitely need yeah. defense. That's just the biggest weakness. And Shiro's biggest criticism is why couldn't he build the defense at all? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna need you're gonna need a backup goalie, and you're gonna have to go pay overpay for two defensemen next year. That's and then you'll have a playoff team. It's going to be a process, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And, you know, there's, we can't make any predictions because we just don't know. No coach, no GM, and uh, got to see where that goes. I think I'll transition since to finish this up last topic is a team that I believe people are just too down on because they love giving themselves, putting themselves in a negative situation because of the Mets. They love to put themselves in the media the way they do for the most ridiculous reasons, but – they ship. This is a team, the Mets, who did finish, or they never even went to a rebuild. They've kind of sustained themselves, and they are one of the four teams. People forget about this because of all the bad press. They could win the NL East this year. And I do, mean, do you agree with that point? They were two games out of the wild card last year, I think. It's how they, they finished. They roared in. Um, 
I think it all depends on Yoannis. I uh, I've always been a big fan of him, and I will never count him out because again, I think he's crazy too. Um, I like crazy people when it comes to sports. Um, oh yeah, but, they're the best people. Torts, we love. I I was always a fan of Torts because of that. But just imagine if Yoannis hits thirty home runs this year, batting behind Pete Alonso, like. If Pete Alonso hits 40, 45, so just if you have Conforto, Alonso, and then Cespedes, and Conforto hits 30, Alonso hits 40, and then Yoannis hits 30 behind him, and we're not even talking about, like, the rest of the team yet. Um, so I am super hyped to find out if Yoannis is healthy and can play ball, because if he can, it's going to be insane. And and then that the best part about that is you're not even talking about the pitching, like we haven't even talked about the pitching yet, and that's what the Mets have always built on for the last decade, and they still have that core. That's what the yeah. that's what the amazing part about it is, and that's why they were able to compete, not just because Pete Pete Alonso was hitting balls in New Jersey and Connecticut. Yeah, no, it's uh, and with the bullpen, like bullpens implode all the time. I mean, it's, it's kind of what happens. Like, relief pitchers, like, they have good years. They have bad years. They have good years. And there's there's some people who, like, have good years all the time, and those guys make billions of dollars. Those guys make big bucks. But, like, in general, the staff is always changing. And um, I think analytics has kind of influenced that and everything um, kind of to – I like. I would leak this last year. Like if Jacob DeGrom pitched all his games, we probably would have made the playoffs. If he's like, yeah, yeah, we're not bringing in a lever. We're just going to, you know, say he pitched five complete games more than he did last year. Like the Mets probably would have made the playoffs. <laughs> I, it's, it, it is nuts to think it just what the Mets did last year. Cause uh, I was, I had Ron Mars on recently and he's a big Mets fan. And we talked about it. And I went to, when I saw the Braves play them in late June, the Mets were just being like a bottom tier, Mar- not Marlins level, because nobody can be Marlins level. <laughs> but we're talking a really bad team at the time outside of Pete Alonso showing up. And the Braves won that game because just the Mets were terrible. And then right, right after that, what, that, that game, when I went to City Field to see that one, the Mets just started taking off. And I, if they could continue that, and like, yeah, they were two games out and I, of the wild card, if they can continue that. I mean, why not can they compete with Washington, Philly, or Atlanta? That each of those teams have holes in them. I mean, they're none of those teams like it's gonna be a wild race this year. It should be if if, if none of these teams disappoint. And well, and that's the thing is I don't really worry about other teams' holes. Like you, you have a job. You know, like in the NLEs, like you have to beat the Phillies. Like you need to beat the shit out of the Phillies. Um, you know, like, <laughs> hey, no way around that. You have to, especially for the Mets. You have to. Um, you know, and then you play the Braves and you play, you know, you play all these teams so many times where like you control your own destiny from the get go. Like there is no need to give up on a game versus in your division. Like even if you're down by six or eight, six or eight runs, like you need to win that game and you need to come back because like, Again, it came down to two games, and that's all they had to do was win two games more and, or beat the, you know, and the Nationals would have made the playoffs or whatever it was, you know. But, like, it's just such a fine line, and you just never give up on that kind of stuff. And it, it should be uh, – it's going to be crazy again. I mean, the, the Nationals, I mean, they, uh, they lost uh, Rendon, but that's about, that's about it, the – I think the Braves got a little bit weaker. They have a little bit of hole with Donaldson, but they're still up there. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, just the, the, the bats in the lineup, it's just pitching consistency. Um, the Phillies have uh, got talents still. They added more. If Bryce Harper could come in and it'd be more consistent, and their bullpen cannot be absolute garbage, they should be competing. And, of course, the Mets. The Mets have a lot of pieces. I mean, theoretically, this should be uh, – like just like what it was last year, it really should be four teams to the line and maybe closer with instead of Atlanta straight up go, uh, getting a head jump on the Nationals and the Mets who had to catch up because the Nationals were on their five hundred two for a while. So it should be a good four team race. 
Yeah, and it'll be fun. I can't wait for baseball to come back. I think baseball – it's always good when your team is good. Um, but, again, like when you have somebody like Jacob DeGrom pitching um, and then you have somebody like Pete Alonso in the – you know, and send in like somebody like Yohan Cespedes, uh, like I think you could it, – it's fun to watch. And plus, like, you know, uh, Keith Hernandez in the booth is probably some of the most hilarious things I've ever heard in baseball so he is and of course actually on that note Gary Cohen has always been one of my favorites I think of course in the tv booth less animated like some of the best Mets calls of all time were him in the radio just going crazy for like the 99 and 2000 seasons that booth is yeah. definitely up there good all right uh you gotta run off do a good old uh be goalie for a hockey game I uh, got predictions for that <laughs> um well man um <laughs> I'm going to go with we're going to win. I don't know. I mean, lately it's been I'm either really good or I'm okay enough to win the game. So um, I'm going to go with okay enough to win the game. So. All right. You heard it here. Matthew Sardo, okay enough to win the game. And then outside of that, I have his insane goalie skills. Uh, you can find them uh, on the Monkeys Fighting Robots website. And, uh, of course, your Twitter accounts. Give us the socials. Uh, my social is very simple. It's my name. It's Matthew Sardo. Um, and that's, um, that's my, that's my Instagram, my Twitter, and then, uh, monkeys fighting robots on Twitter, which is really annoying. And it is at monkeys underscore robots because there isn't enough room for fighting. So that's where we are. <laughs> and you definitely need to follow that because maybe if you're not certain about buying, picking up a book, uh, an issue or not, you can catch a quick review on it, maybe catch, and then it's a really good uh, review site if you just want to see what's going on. Maybe if you want to, if you're on the fence about something, check out the review site. And of course, all the news coming up. Uh, and of course, this is uh, uh, wrong, but just us. Uh, you can follow me on K on Twitter uh, at KDoc underscore fifty two. Uh, I think it's at Sports Opinion thirty for the main page for Sports Opinions podcast. And uh, this has been episode seven. Thank you for listening, and uh, have a great night. <laughs>